Welcome to Central Missouri Alumni Stories. I'm your host, Corey Bittner. Uh, today, I am joined by the Director of Military and Veteran Services at UCM, uh, Marine veteran and American reality TV show champion, uh, Tough as Nails, Kelly Murphy. All right, Kelly, uh, good morning, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Thanks for having me today, I appreciate it. Of course, I'm doing great. Thank you for uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to, to come on the show and, and kind of talk with our audience here. And I, as we talked briefly before we started, uh, you know, there's some folks that will listen to this um, as a podcast and others that will watch the uh, video. Um, but again, I, I can speak, I believe on the behalf of the audience that uh, I'm really excited to have you here today and kind of kind of talk about your your story and what surely has been an exciting year or two for you. Well, I appreciate it. Absolutely. What, um, <clears throat> you know, as we kind of get started here today, you know, we were, we were talking about, obviously, you know, I'm sure that you've done a number of these, um, you know, these interviews and discussions, especially since the show, uh, with you, of course, being the winner too, which is really exciting. And we're going to kind of get to that. Um, but when we think about the time before that and kind of your story specifically, I mean, can you just sort of, you know, get us kicked off here, kind of tell me a little bit more about you know, where you're from, what, you're, what, what you've done, and ultimately kind of what led you to UCM? Sure. So a little bit about myself. So I was born in Indiana, a small town south of Indianapolis. Um, when I was two, my parents moved to Southern California because my dad's a California native. Um, he was a blue collar worker, construction guy, um, former army veteran. So we lived in Southern California um, till right before my eighth grade year of school, then they moved back to Indiana. Um, I finished high school and while I was in high school, I joined the Marine Corps. Um, I shipped to boot camp about five months after I graduated, um, did my boot camp in California, um, really found myself in the Marine Corps. So for example, in high school, I was the type of kid that would, I would take an F on a, the oral presentation of the book report because I didn't like standing up in front of my classmates. Sure. So I would make sure that I tried to get an A on the written part but I, I didn't want to stand up and talk. So um, what I learned about myself in the Marine Corps, especially that first six years, is the Marine Corps really does a good job of setting people up for success when it comes to um, training other Marines. So my first promotion, um, I, I was in charge of about three to four Marines. And then with each promotion, you know, you're in charge of maybe 12 and the next one, 24. And then before you know it, um, you're in charge of, you know, a platoon or a whole section of Marines. So I learned a lot about myself that first six years, and I loved the Marine Corps so much, I re-enlisted for another four. Um, okay. I had some additional duties as an instructor for my job. I was a aircraft maintenance. I worked on the electronics and weapon systems. Um, I re-enlisted again. I did a tour of recruiting duty. So I was a recruiter for the Marine Corps, I recruited out of Southern Indiana. I returned back to Camp Pendleton um, to start deploying again. Um, I ended up getting promoted to my last rank as a first sergeant, um, did some back-to-back -back deployments with the infantry. And then um, the Marine Corps tries to take you out of the fight, so to speak, gives you a break from deploying. So I got sent to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Um, it's an army base, but it has the largest detachment of Marines outside of Marine Corps base. Hmm. And I was there for about a year and I got to see the kids every day. Um, you know, it was kind of normal seven to five job, if you will. Um, you know, had lunch breaks, and so it was, a, it was a different time in the Marine Corps for me, but it made me realize that if I stayed in any longer, um, that I would be deploying again, and at the time, my oldest daughter was, I think, sixth grade, so I okay. knew that if I stayed in the Marine Corps, um, I was going to be gone again and missing the second half of their life, so I retired at 22 years. Um, we had never lived in Missouri until Fort Leonard Wood, and I really love Missouri, I fell in love with the state, so I decided to, to basically hunt for the job I wanted in my next career to be in Missouri. Um, I had the opportunity to, to interview with Lowe's as the HR manager um, for this store here in Warrensburg and for the store in Springfield. So we drove up to Warrensburg, um, spent a whole day um, up here. I really fell in love with the, the community, just driving around. It was close to Kansas City, but the college was important to us. Um, UCM is actually one of the reasons we decided to take the, 
the Warrensburg opportunity because I also had the opportunity to be the HR in Springfield. Um, but I chose the Warrensburg store um, so, because of UCM. Uh, my wife actually went back to college. Um, she got her degree nice. from UCM, so she's an alum. Um, she's now a um, STEM teacher at the local middle school. And my oldest daughter is a junior here at UCM, so she should be alum next year. Um, so she's crushing her grades, doing great. It's awesome. Um, on the dean's list. So I'll have actually two alums in the family from UCM. So really, UCM is a big reason why we actually picked Warrensburg um, okay. um, to settle down at. Where, where is your uh, Where is your wife from? Uh, she's from a small town in Indiana as well. Okay. Um, she was born and raised in Indiana and then lives, um, the town's called Spencer. Okay. She lives in the outskirts of that. It's kind of, um, I would say it's within the area of the Indiana University. Okay. Gotcha. And, and then you have two daughters? Yes, I have two and okay. a son. My, uh, my youngest daughter just graduated Navy boot camp um, last week. Um, so I'm hoping to go up and thank you. Hoping to go up and see her soon, as soon as the COVID restrictions ease up. And then my son's a junior here at the local high school. Okay, good, good. Yeah. So you've, um, yeah, I mean, you, you know, it sounds like your, you know, your military career, how many, you know, one, one thing that we didn't really touch on, I mean, in terms of when you were deployed overseas, how many different deployments were there over the course of your career? So I did uh, several when I was younger in the Marine Corps. Sure. Then my last two um, is with when I had kids. Okay. So there was about a two and a half year time frame that I was only home for about six months. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Because so, for the Marine Corps, when you're not overseas, you're in the middle of Camp Pendleton training. You know, you go out to the field on a Monday, train all week, then come back for the weekend. Or you're going to another base in California, or you're hopping on a ship and just floating off the coast, practicing amphibious operations for a few weeks. So even though you're not deployed overseas, you're doing all the practice that it's that's required to deploy. Okay, yeah. So I mean, it's a um, obviously keeping you busy and keeping you training for the uh, you know for the fight. What is um, you know in terms of your you know toward the end of your career, were you? And it sounds like obviously the fact that you would have been deployed was one of the, you know, one of the one of the reasons behind your decision to retire. But when the time came to retire, were you were you ready to move on? Were you ready for the next chapter? Uh, I really wasn't. So um, somebody asked me the other day what my dream job would be, and I said yeah. I already did it. I, I was a Marine. That was my dream job. Awesome. Um, my plan was to go thirty years because um, I said I was in for twenty two. And the only reason that I didn't stay was because I wanted to watch the kids grow up. Sure. But, I mean, other than that, um, I had a hard time adjusting. Um, yeah, tell me about that. Well, when I retired, I, like I said, I took a job with Lowe's, so I was a total civilian company. Um, I didn't want to belong to the VFW, the American Legion, the, Mar the local Marine Corps League. Um, I didn't want to be part of any kind of veteran organization and I think one of the reasons why is because I felt that if I was around those like fellow veterans or fellow former Marines that I'd miss the Marine Corps even more. So I totally separated myself from the military. Okay. Um, um, you know, grew my hair, beard, like the whole nine yards, like totally yeah. separated myself from any kind of, you know, of course I'm still very proud and always will be that I'm a Marine because you you know, you're always a Marine the rest of your life. Yes. I just didn't want to associate with other military service members because I was afraid that I would miss it. So it took me a few years to to kind of adjust to the civilian life when it comes to um, just the way things are done, the way problems are handled, especially as an HR manager. As a Marine First Sergeant, like you're the, the right hand, so to speak. So sure. when you say something that gets done, <laughs> uh, adjusting to um, civilian life was a little bit different. Expectations. So I had to learn that expectations in a civilian corporation are different than the military. So it took a while to adjust to that. But I, you know, after a few years, I felt pretty comfortable in my role as the HR. I was having a good time. I wasn't really looking to leave Lowe's. Um, just due to different corporate direction, they eliminated the HR position from their stores. I see. So, so that put me on the job hunt. And then I knew about this position because um, 
in ZHR, I would post positions and then periodically I would make the people that used to work at the center aware of those positions. So I was familiar with um, the Veterans Center here at UCM. Um, I had been here before as an HR manager, just kind of promoting some Lowe's positions. And then I had a friend that kind of said, hey, that position's actually open. And it just worked out. So my last day at Lowe's was July 13th. My first day of work was July 1st here. Oh, so, really? Yeah, so I took vacation days. Um, I had some vacation days stay, saved up at Lowe's, so I used them so I could do my orientation here. Nice. What, what year was that, by the way, Kelly? So I took over here in July of 2012. Uh, excuse me, July of 2019. Okay. So July 2019 is when um, I left Lowe's and then transitioned to UCM. Okay. And that's when the stick kind of began. Can you, can you tell me what, um, I mean, in terms of your role now with the university, what does that just look like on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, what are, you, what are you doing? Who are you serving? What's that look like? So we serve, um, we serve the veteran community going back to school. We serve veteran family members who their family members um, have transferred benefits to them. Um, we service active duty and reserve service members. Um, so we have a certifying official that works in the office and she certifies those veterans benefits so they get their tuition paid, their BH, whatever kind of GI Bill they're on that gets processed and the veteran gets taken care of. Um, we provide just a place for veterans to hang out, um, resources for them. We try to connect them with different places on campus. Um, different offices. So like the Career Service Center, we try to pair up with them. So if a veteran's looking for a job or needs help with a resume, uh, we work closely with those offices to ensure that the veteran is, is taken care of. Or the service member's family member. Um, you know, and the office is open to anybody that comes in. Um, if you have a family member that served in the military and you just want a place to hang out and eat lunch, you're more than welcome to come here. What, um, okay, that's pretty neat. That, is there... You know, I read, I think it was on, obviously, you know, the show Tough as Nails, right? Your, your specific bio. And I think there was a question that you were asked and, you know, your, your response was people would be surprised to find out how many people we actually serve. Um, what does that look like? I mean, how many different, you know, veterans or families is the organization and you kind of, you know, part of serving? So our certifying officials and we, we have an opening in the office. We're actually hiring a second position. Um, okay. We certify about 900 students every semester. No kidding. Yep. So we have quite a few service connected students. Like I said, that could be a family member using their parents' benefit. Sure. Um, yeah, about 900 military connected students um, is what gets processed through the center. What has been, um, yeah, that's more than I thought. <laughs> that's a larger number than I was expecting. What, um, since you started, you know, a little over a year ago, um, what's been the, what's been your favorite part of the job and also what's been the most, uh, you know, difficult or challenging part? Uh, my favorite part of the job is just getting to talk to the veterans, getting to know a little bit about them, um, learning, you know, uh, things that they like in, about the school. Um, it's been fun getting to know the ROTC group, too. We're trying to tie them in on a lot to try to incorporate them. Um, starting some programs to hopefully help them out. So like a mentorship program. Um, everything's kind of on hold right now because of COVID. Right. But, you know, we have some initiatives to hopefully um, tie ROTC in a little bit closer here to our veterans. Good. Um, make them feel like they're really part of the team. You know, I know because some of the ROTC students haven't even been to boot camp yet. So sometimes they feel like they're not part of the team because they're not, you know, serving or a veteran. Sure. Um, so we're trying to tie them in to make them feel more, like more connected with us. Um, I say the most challenging is just trying to get some of the veterans to actually come into the office. You know, sometimes you have the, the veteran, like myself, for example, like when I got out, I said, I kind of distanced myself. Some of the veterans just want to go to school and be left alone. Um, so we're just trying to let them know that, hey, you can be left alone. You know, you can sit in the corner here, but this center is um, open to you for your use. Yeah, I can imagine that that's the case. And I'm sure, it, you know, if you felt the way that you did about separating yourself from the military, there's probably lots of other veterans that, you know, take the same approach. And um, I'm glad that you guys are able to be there and, you know, at least help serve as a, as a resource, um, you know, and give people access to the resources that they need. Has there been a, you know, kind of one other question that I wanted to ask, you know, in regards to that was, 
you know, taking back to a comment that you made earlier that, you know, you and your wife uh, and your family, presumably to some extent, you know, fell in love with Missouri, uh, specifically, you know, with Lawrenceburg and UCM is kind of what, you know, brought you to the area. I mean, what do you, what is it that you love the most about, you know, what do you love about Lawrenceburg? And then my second part of that question would be, you know, what do you love about UCM? Why do you believe in it? Well, what I like about Warrensburg that it's a small community. So like I said, I, the mm-hmm. town that I grew up in, uh, in Indiana at least, because California, it was pretty crazy. Different story, but, yeah. Um, so the town that I grew up in during high school, my parents still live there. To this day, it still has, I think, four four-way stop signs, um, a little bitty grocery store that has two gas pumps out front, and I think the post office could easily fit within my office. <laughs> really? <laughs> So it's very small. Um, yeah. Warrensburg obviously is a lot bigger than that, but it's the same kind of relaxed, small community. Um, I'm not really worried about crime here. Um, it's, and it's close to Kansas City. It's close to Lee Summit. It's pretty close to some, you know, some good entertainment. And it just provided a good place to where we can actually enjoy kind of a quiet country life, but go do stuff in the city without you know, driving several hours. Sure. Um, what I like about UCM is the, the leadership. I think Dr. Best and Dr. Bridgman, the provost, have some great um, vision for the way they want UCM to, to go. Um, talking to those two gentlemen, I think they have a really good plan. Um, and hopefully once the budget eases up with um, the state, um, they'll have the funds to do those things. But I think that the university leadership is pretty good, pretty solid. Yeah, if there, if there were a, um, and I agree with you completely, and I know, you know, from a, a previous episode of the show, you know, having Dr. Best on and getting to know him a little bit more on a personal relationship, you know, through my my service as a, uh, you know, a board director for the Alumni Foundation, it's, you know, it's been great to hear and learn more about what the vision is. Um, if there were a, and maybe the answer to this is, is an obvious one based on what you just said, but, you know, if there was someone who was a you know, a junior or senior in high school who was contemplating, you know, where they wanted to go to college, what, you know, why would you say, you know, UCM is the place for you? I would say the faculty. Um, the faculty truly care about the students. Um, you know, when my wife was going to school here, um, the faculty, you know, and obviously she wasn't a traditional student, you know, she was sure. in her 40s going to school. Um, she was treated with respect. Um, she wasn't treated like she was an 18 year old kid going to school. And then at the same time, my daughter, who was 18 when she started school, um, is treated with the same amount of respect that she was treated with. So they treat all students with respect and courtesy. They have a passion for the students. Um, Not once have I had any, heard either uh, my wife or my daughter say, you know, that, that instructor just won't work with me. That's frustrating. I can't get a hold of them. It seems like anytime they have an issue with the class that um, there's a faculty member that's willing to step up and, and, and help them. And I've heard it from the students that are in here. Obviously, you know, you, you do get frustrated with some of the faculty, sure. but it, I don't think that somebody has never been so frustrated that they can't find common ground with the faculty. Um, so I think the faculty is definitely a selling factor for UCM in that they truly care about the student. Yeah, no, I agree completely. And as obviously as an you know as an alumni myself, that was very much my experience as well. So I'm I'm glad to hear that you know that tradition is kind of uh, you know has lived on. So you know what I, what I'm going to talk to you about next is uh, you know obviously the show right tough as nails and and the whole experience kind of going through it. Can you you know I'll let you kind of start. I just I, I'd kind of like to hear you know what um, what compelled you to to sign up, what the experience was like. Um, what somebody who's, you know, watched the show that might not know about everything that kind of goes on behind the scenes. Can you just kind of fill us in on the, on the whole thing? Sure can. So when I retired from the Marine Corps, I, I never really used much social media, but I was approached by an apparel company. Um, hey, we'd like to sponsor you because I do a lot of athletic stuff. Um, yep. I, at the time I was a, a, a competing CrossFit athlete. So an apparel company approached me and said, hey, we want to sponsor you, you know, throw you some apparel. Um, you wear it, take pictures, but you have to have an Instagram account. I'm like, well, what's Instagram? <laughs> sure. At the time, Instagram was only about two years old because it started in 2010. Um, so this was in 2012. I said, okay, I started an Instagram account. So I would post some pictures of me wearing their gear. 
you know, work out in it and you know, say, hey, go to this website, use my discount code. So yep. I just started having fun with Instagram, posting, you know, workout videos and occasionally nice. a throwback picture, you know, wearing uniform. Yep. Well, last January, um, out of the blue, I got a message from a gentleman from the Discovery Channel saying, hey, we, we would like for you to be on a television show. I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, I chalked it up as a joke. And he's like, no, I'm, I'm serious. My name's Jonathan. Here's my information. Look me up. So I looked him up, and sure enough, he's a casting agent. Um, so I said, sure, Jonathan, well, let's talk. And I did some Zoom interviews for the Discovery Channel. Um, the show just never really took off for them. But I thought, well, that was a cool experience. You know, I've never done casting for a television show. I really don't watch much reality TV. Um, let alone to be part of one, but I, so I thought it was neat. And then the, you know, the, the rest of the year goes by. Then last October, um, Jonathan contacts me again and says, Hey, CBS is doing this show. I'm not casting for it, but you need to apply. And here's the link. So I said, well, what the heck? So it took like 30 seconds. I filled out this, this quick, this quick online form. And the next day CBS contacted me and said, Hey, can you do a zoom interview? So I said, sure. So I did a Zoom interview, like I believe it was that next day okay. with a gentleman by the name of Gabriel from CBS Casting. And then a few days later, he's like, hey, CBS loved your interview. You we want you to Zoom again. So I think that next week I Zoomed again. And this time it was actually with Phil, the host of the show, um, his wife, who is a co one his co-producer, hmm. and then the other two producers and then some executives from CBS. And I did this Zoom interview. It didn't last very long, and maybe two minutes. <laughs> okay. Like, All right. <clears throat> okay. Well, that was a good experience once again. And then they contacted me. Um, I forgot how much time had passed, but then they invited me to to California in December. So I flew out to California for a week, where I did some casting stuff. Um, so you know, I got to meet them. They got to meet me. Um, you do some other casting stuff as well. Um, you, you talk, um, you see a doctor for one, just to make sure that you're healthy um, and do some other, some other testing. I'm not sure how much I could talk about when it comes to the casting, but so yeah. you know, like background checks and some basic stuff like that. Sure. Um, and then I flew back to California once again, thinking, well, that was a pretty cool process. And then right after the new year, um, Jenny, who is the casting director, called me and said, hey, Murph, we're going to bring you out on the show. Awesome. So, so I flew out uh, mid-January. Um, the I got, got to LAX, got picked up. Uh, we went to our extended stay hotel in Burbank. Um, as soon as I got there, I checked in, and we went over some rules and some basic stuff, and I turned in my cell phone and my, my work computer. So we had no communication with... Um, the, your family, friends, for the whole time we were out there, which was about 30 days. Wow. Even the phone in your room could only call 911 or the front desk. You couldn't receive a call. <laughs> they thought of everything, huh? Yeah. And it's just to, to keep the integrity of the show. Of course. You know, you know, CBS spends a lot of money to put the show together, and they didn't want spoilers. So they didn't want you communicating daily, letting people know what was happening. And so we signed disclosure agreements, the whole nine yards. Um, the first several days we were out there um, was some basic admin stuff. Um, we did a physical test called the, um, the brutal, brutal, it's called the brutal, brutal truth challenge. Tongue okay. twist. So it consists of a bunch of burpees um, in an eight minute time frame. And then we did some fitting for our Carhartt clothing, um, a photography session, a bunch of interviews that you saw on the show, yep. and um, some HR classes as well, because we're CBS employees at that point. So some basic hiring classes. And then we started filming that first Friday we were there for episode one. And then you guys were, you, you mentioned, you know, previously kind of off air. I mean, you were filming, your filming schedule looked like what? So we filmed, so that first Friday we were there, we filmed episode one, which was the, the wheelbarrow challenge and then the brick lane challenge. We had that Saturday off and then we filmed from that point on for the next three, three weeks, we filmed Sundays through Fridays. 
Uh, the day would start off about six o'clock in the morning. We'd meet in the hotel lobby for breakfast. And by around 6.30 or 6.40, we were loading up in the vans. Um, we would get in the vans, um, audio crew would come and turn our microphones on, cameras on. Um, they would give us the GPS website wherever we were going that day. Uh, we did follow a lead van that had two producers in it, um, just in, in case, you know, just for the show integrity, we would all follow each other. Uh, the GPS was just a backup, you know, the traffic. And then we would show up to the location. Um, you know, sometimes we would um, be blindfolded right before we got there. So that way, if you know we're coming up on a site, um, we would pull over, blindfold us, and then we would turn the corner, then unblindfold, and there's the job site. So we had no idea what we were doing until we actually got okay. to the location. And then, well, when you got to the location, you knew where you were at. You still had no idea what you were doing until Phil came on set and said, hey guys, this is today's challenge. So, um, we so up would, until that point, you did not know what you were getting yourself into each and every day. That's correct. You did not know what you were doing until the day of right before you did it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty tough. That's, uh, you really have to be able to adjust and adapt to do that. Yeah. So what would happen, um, you know, Phil would come on and say, Hey, this is what you guys are going to do. And then, you know, the rules team would come in and go over the specific rules um, of what you can and can't do. So for example, the wheelbarrow challenge, um, when you're using the wheelbarrow, you can put no more than three bags of concrete okay. in the wheelbarrow. So like small details like that. Um, but there was no script. You weren't told what to say, what to do. Phil just wanted you to be yourself and do the, the, the jobs as quick as, as possible. So that was the best thing about the show is you just got to yeah. be yourself. Like you weren't told to act a certain way. Yeah, that's great. So everything that you saw on TV was 100% real. Nothing was, nothing was made up. Um, that's why I would do the show again in a heartbeat because it was truly a genuine show. I wasn't asked to be anybody else but me. Um, and that was it. And it, that was the, the fun part about it. Uh, so when we got to there, to the location, um, you know, Phil would say, hey, this is what you guys are going to do. Um, we would do the job and then uh, the rest of the day would be like filming interviews or depend upon what kind of day it was. So we filmed three episodes a week. So for example, um, Sunday would be, we would film the team challenge part of the episode. Then Monday would be the individual challenge. Then after lunch would be the overtime. Then Tuesday would be the individual Wednesday, or excuse me, team Wednesday individual, Thursday team, Friday individual. Then Saturdays were our day off. Saturday was a day to do catch up on laundry, rest. Uh, we'd make a group trip to the local Walmart for any kind of groceries or, you know, just to get out of the, the, the sure. normal routine, uh, maybe hit the hotel gym, and then we'd start again on Sunday. What, um, I, I've got to ask, so when you showed up though on, you know, on day one, Obviously, I, presumably, you're kind of sizing up the competition, right? Looking at who else is there. Did you, did you show up? Did you feel like, I can absolutely do this thing? I can win this thing? Did you feel like you were overwhelmed? Or did you feel like you had as good a shot as, as, as anybody? Uh, I felt that I had a, a good, as good a shot as anybody. But I've learned in the Marine Corps, you know, some of my Marines were five foot one, five foot two, 110 pounds, and were some of the most fiercest Marines I've ever worked with. Some of the Marines I worked with were bigger than I was and, um, you know, fierce as could be. So when I saw somebody like Michelle, a 62 year old lady, um, you know, that was pretty small in stature, um, I learned from the Marine Corps that you never underestimate anyone. So when I look out on the field, I'm like, well, she's here for a reason. Um, yep. You know, so, you know, I don't know what kind of you know, tricks she has up her sleeve or what kind of knowledge she has, you know, what her strengths are. So with each episode, though, you did get to know a little bit about your castmates. Um, you got to know them as a person. You got to know their abilities. And, um, you know, she was so well-rounded. Um, she knew a little bit about everything and was actually and was good at it. So, you know, you heard the, the term jack of all trades, master of none. Well, she was a jack of all trades and a master of many. So wow. 
you know, so, and then you see somebody like Lee, you know, Lee's 61 years old, big, huge guy, um, you know, and he's strong as heck, you know, and he has a wealth of knowledge as well. You know, he's done pretty much a ton of things in his life. Um, then you see some of the younger casts that you know are going to bring it every day. So, um, so the first time you walk on set too is a little overwhelming. Sure. Um, you haven't seen the whole workings until we walked on to the first day, the wheelbarrow challenge. We, you know, we walk around the corner and then all of a sudden there's hundreds of people. There's cameras all over the place, the boom, they're flying a drone up in the air. You've got a, a camera on a guide wire that's yeah. you know, sliding by. Um, you know, you've got all kinds of trucks there, you know, Ford trucks, but you also have the, the trucks that hold all the equipment and you're like, wow, I had no idea it takes this much to film a show. Sure. So, you know, you walk in that first day. So not only are you thinking about, man, these 11 other people, I don't know what they have to bring, but then you're also thinking, wow, they this is kind of overwhelming right now. There's so much going on and so many people getting ready to watch what we're doing. Um, but then once Phil blows the work whistle, um, you know, at least for that first day, you kind of just focus on what you're doing. And then after the first few days, you just kind of, you just, all the camera stuff just kind of, you know, is just normal now. So, you know, that kind of went away. Uh, and then you just really truly focus on, on competing. No, that's, that's, that is, uh, it's pretty neat and interesting to hear about. I mean, like you said, it takes a village, right? I mean, it's just a, like you said, walking out there day one, it's like, wow, this is a, you know, a whole legitimate big production, right? That makes all of this happen. And um, then you've got to show up and perform too. Yeah, I think one of the, the producers is the one that said this. So let's say you're going to, let's say, okay, Corey, you're going to build this birdhouse out of Legos. But what they're going to do is they're going to, drop off a dump truck load of Legos. And that's what you get to choose from to, to build this birdhouse. So that's how much filming was done. We filmed, you know, we were there, you know, started the day at six, sometimes wrapping up um, at nine at night, back to the hotel, depending upon where we filmed at in California. You know, if we were in downtown LA or Southern LA, it made for a really late day because of traffic. Um, and then the whole time, you know, you're in the van they're filming in the van, catching all that audio and video of you guys talking about the day or the next day. Um, and then, so there's so much filming that you do um, that the producers really do a good job of, of pulling that stuff out and piecing the show together. And they, they did this from home, you know, cause we finished filming on February 14th was the final, was the, was the finale. And then shortly thereafter, you know, they got sent all sent home to work from home. So they made hundreds of copies of all the tapes and the producers literally put the show together working from their houses. So definitely have to Crazy. give them credit on putting the show together during such a difficult time. Yeah, that is, um, that's an impressive feat. I can just imagine how much time and energy goes into, like you said, taking all of that, you know, sorting through all those Legos, right? I mean, basically pulling all, all of that information together and then making it into, you know, the production that ultimately, you know, goes on air. What, um, what was your favorite part of the whole experience? I mean, maybe your answer is winning, but you know, and, and if so, great. But yeah, I would ask you, you know, aside from that, what was, what was the best part of the whole experience for you? Actually getting to meet everybody on Savage Crew, everybody on my team. Uh, so some people asked me, um, I Zoomed with um, a water polo club out of Utah last week, just talking to the kids about like teamwork and stuff like that. <laughs> And so I tell everybody the same thing. My favorite episode is the moving challenge. Um, so those of you that have, haven't seen the show, um, my team, we won the first team challenge and then we lost um, literally four in a row. Um, you know, we had communication issues. We weren't working well together, but with each week we, we got to know more about each other and we, you know, we argued and then we, you know, we found out, Hey, um, which way do we work best together? Then the culmination of our communicating and having patience and a little bit of grace with each other was the moving challenge. So when my team closes the door on the moving on the van and that door closes and you see Savage Crew hooting, hollering, you know, that is pure and true emotion. That is six people that overcame so much 
in a short amount of time to learn how to work together. And just to watch that episode is, is by far my favorite episode. Um, to see my team truly celebrate after coming, like our personal adversity was, was pretty awesome. Yeah, very cool. Well, like you said, I mean, it's all very authentic and genuine. And it's, uh, you know, that's just a, there was so much squeeze into a month, right? And these are people that I'm sure, you know, after that month where it's like, you almost feel like you've known them your whole life. And to think you just met them one month ago, right? And you spent, you know, day in and day out, mornings, days, evenings, et cetera, together and gone through, you know, the hardships, the trials, the tribulations, the victories, the celebrations, right? It's a lot. It's just a lot to, to squeeze into one month with a bunch of people that you didn't know prior to that. Yeah, it felt, it, to me, it, it felt like the military and the fact that, so a lot of times you get transferred to a unit getting ready to go overseas. So you have to know, you get, you have to get to know a group of people in a short amount of time to accomplish a mission. And that's what the show felt like. So we had six of us that had to get to know each other, you know, our, our likes, dislikes, you know, our pet peeves, pretty much everything about each other so we could work together. So the show did remind me of being in the military. And I think that's one of the reasons I enjoyed the show so much. It gave me a chance to feel like what I've been missing for so many years. And that's that teamwork that you have in the military. Yeah, that camaraderie and that, uh, yeah, like that teamwork, like you said. No, it's great. I, and I, uh, again, you know, it, it was, it's been a lot of fun to watch and to follow, of course. And, you know, you know uh, uh, lastly, of course, to kind of see you victorious, right? I mean, to see you kind of come out on top. What was, walk me through that. I mean, if you, if you can kind of rewind back and think, you know, the last, you know, five minutes of that challenge is, is the, at least the show itself is kind of wrapping up. Right. And you're, uh, you know, you're taking the bolts off and you're putting the boards up. I mean, what was, you know, what was kind of going through your mind at that point? Yeah. So I, you know, obviously I would competed against Danny several times. So, you know, he's the kind of guy that can come out of nowhere and, you know, and, and get a victory. So at no point did I feel like I was going to win until I got to where, I, when I was putting those final boards in, and you could see on camera that my hands were so shaky yep. trying to put the bolts in. Um, there was an overwhelming of emotion, adrenaline, um, because that was the first time that I felt like, you know, I'm actually going to win this um, it was during that time. And then to climb up those steps and then what I actually grabbed at the top of each set of steps. So was on the little podium was a key fob to the truck. Yeah. So when I reached, and grabbed the top of the stairs what I grabbed off that little podium was the key fob to the truck so once you had that key fob in hand that was the winning oh, one you won. yeah so and obviously um you know I pretty much went into tears right away just because it was an emotional release um to compete that hard for that whole time and then to finally bring that victory home and like I said I, I didn't do the show for the truck the money we had no idea what the prizes were going to be until the first day. Oh, really? Okay. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. So I had no idea going out to California that you had the opportunity to win a truck or win $200,000. Um, I went out there because I wanted to prove to myself that I could still bring it like I did in the Marine Corps. So to me, when I got to the top of the podium, that, that was it. I proved to myself you did it. Uh, that I could still do those things that I did, you know, because like I said, when I left the Marine Corps, I wasn't ready to go. But to prove to myself that I, you know, because this year, um, next month is my, would have been my 30th year in the Marine Corps. So for me to do this in what would be the, my 30th year in the Marine Corps, it meant a lot to me. Yeah, that's, that is, uh, that, that's very neat. And it was, um, you know, I also thought it was, you know, it was so cool that you guys were able to also have your families there. Yeah, we had no idea they were coming. So like oh, really? I said, so they, um, so that day of filming was February 14th, Valentine's Day. Yep. They told the families that they were coming out for a Valentine's Day special. They had no idea they were coming out to watch the final three. Wow. And we had no idea they were there. Literally, I thought we were getting ready to start. And then all of a sudden, Phil's like, brings the families out. So I don't even think I lasted two seconds before I cried. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, for me, you know, like I said, we didn't communicate with the families. Um, you know, they brought Shelby out because, you know, she was leaving for Navy boot camp. Yep. So you went from 
adrenaline at an all time high because you're getting ready to compete for the finale to now all of a sudden like emotional like moment to where you see the family and and then all of a sudden now you got to ramp back up to get the adrenaline going against you. Yeah. So it was like a, an emotional roller coaster. You're right. You know, right before you get ready to go. So, <clears throat> excuse me, but the but the family's there. You know, it give, definitely gave me another reason. You know, to push really hard. Yep. Um, but there was a time, probably when I started sawing the second piece of lumber, because Phil asked me, "Hey, what were you thinking about?" When I felt that I was getting close to Danny, cutting that second board, I didn't hear anybody until I was on top of yeah, that, that last container. Um, I just tried to get into a zone, focus on breathing. Um, you know, I kept switching arms um, just to give my right arm some rest. Um, and I didn't hear anybody's voice again until I got on top of that that last container to start, you know, I'm, I'm taking the, the nuts off those bolts. Um, but other than that, it was, I could hear people cheering. I could hear Savage Crew yelling Murph. I can hear, you know, the families yelling. And then when I got to the top and then looked down and saw, for example, Shelby, you know, it was pretty cool. Yeah, it is cool. Well, I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad that you had such a, I mean, that the whole thing was such a positive experience for you. Uh, the fact that you're able, of course, to come out on top, that your, your wife and daughter were able to be there, and obviously, of course, that you had a UCM shirt on <laughs> when, you won, when you won the competition. We obviously, there's a lot of us that love seeing that. Yeah, so when, you know, obviously, I'd, I'd only been here for about six months or so. Right. So, you know, I didn't have vacation time. So I approached Dr. Best, you know, about the opportunity. Um, and, you know, I thought since you know, he's going to let me go out here and do this. So I went to Central Logos and, and had those shirts made. <laughs> That's why the logo. Really? The back so, <laughs> nice. so I asked them to make the logo really large. And then um, I worked with Susan Smedley, the marketing VP. She helped me get um, the authorization signed off for UCM. Um, otherwise, if, without the authorization, um, you know, CBS would have just blurred out the logo. And then the cool. Nancy, who Nancy has worked with um, our outfits, so she she's the one that helped us with the Carhartt gear. But she's the lady that I was communicating with before I even left. You know, taking pictures of different things to wear, and then she said, "Yeah, the the the, the shirt is in okay." So, you know, I wear flannels a lot, obviously, but the UCM shirt was was underneath the flannel. So I was allowed to wear either or. So um, on our individual days, we wore what we would normally wear to work. <clears throat> so, you know, I'm in khaki pants, um, boots and flannels. Um, you see Danny wearing shorts and t-shirt. You know, he's, a, he's an independent drywaller. That's what he wears, you know, on a normal basis. So that's why we always wore the same clothes during our individual is because that's what you would normally wear to work. Makes sense. The Carhartt gear is what we wore when we competed together as a team. Team, yeah. No, very cool though. It's uh, and you know I'm I'm very happy for you and and to you know see of course that exposure and and for you and your family right and and like you said just on a personal level too the fact that you're able to prove to yourself you know eight years after your retirement that you could still bring it the same as you used to um, and competing against some very stiff competition it was uh, a lot of fun to watch and. Um, you know, I, I'm excited to see, you know, what, what's in the future for you. Um, I know, you know, Kelly, that we are um, kind of approaching the end of our time here. And I, again, I appreciate you taking uh, your time today. I want to just go one through uh, one last quick segment here. Uh, it's what I've, what we've called the Mule Minute. And uh, what this is, is I'm just going to, designed to just be a fun segment. I'm going to rattle off a couple of questions. There's no stopwatch or timer um, by any means, but I'm just going to rattle off a couple of questions. And I'm just curious to hear your, uh, you know, kind of your initial response. Your, your, um, you know, what first comes to mind? Ready? You think you can do it? I can. Okay, I think you can too. Um, all right, so let, let's go ahead and get started. So, uh, first question, make this an easy one. What is your favorite destination to visit? Um, I say my favorite destination to visit it would be um, when we're talking country would be Australia. Okay. What um, What's your favorite way to just relax or unwind? Um, 
I like to sit back on the deck and have an occasional cigar. Nice. What, um, if there is, if there's a period in time that you could go back to in history, it could be in the last 50 years or, you know, the last 5,000 years, whatever it might be. If you could go back in time to any period, when would you go back to? Uh, I'd probably say the wild west time frame. Ah, that's a good answer. I don't think I've heard that one before, but, uh, I do like that. What, um, are you a, <clears throat> excuse me, um, another question that I have for you is um, in terms of, you know, in the Warrensburg community, in the area, what, what's your favorite spot to go in Warrensburg, whether it's a, a restaurant, a park, a gym, whatever, what's, what's your favorite spot to go? Uh, I would say Red Horse Fitness. That's the current gym that I work out now that is a veteran owned company. So he's actually de in the Air Force deployed right now. So it's nice. just a, a good group of people from the Warrensburg community. That's good. That is, uh, that is good to know. Red Horse, you said. What, um, what is one profession outside of what you do now? I mean, if it, or, or even outside of your military career, if you were to go try to, something to, do, to do something completely different than what, would you, than what you're doing, what would that be? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I, th I think I'd like to work in an off-road specialty store. Okay. All right. That, that's, that's a pretty specific answer. That's good, though. What... Um, what another fun one for you here if you uh if you walked into an establishment kelly and there's a karaoke machine and you had to get up and sing one song what would you sing uh that's easy because i only sing two songs one okay. would be happy birthday to the kids and the other would be uh the marines hymn okay all right that's good <laughs> that's good <laughs> um and then lastly what is uh what's just one piece of advice that you'd give to someone doesn't need to be necessarily an alumni or a high school or college student, what's just you know one piece of advice that's always been valuable to you that you'd like to pass on? Uh, I would say take advantage of every opportunity that comes your way. Um, never pass up a chance to do anything because you may not ever get that opportunity again. Whether or not that is applying for a television show or passing through a small town and you're like, well, look at that small museum, like stop. Because more than likely you'll probably never be in that town again and if you are, will you ever stop at that museum? So just, if you see something that you're interested in, give it a shot. Because That's good. You never get it the second chance. I like that. That is, that is solid advice. Well, again, Kelly, or I guess I should say Murph. Maybe I should have been calling you Murph the whole time here on the show. Um, but again, thank you, for, uh, thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, congratulations again uh, you know, on, your, on your success on the show. Uh, thank you for, of course, your, you know, your service to our country and then everything that you're doing now for the university uh, and the veteran community. Um, for those of you that are, are interested, uh, Murph, if somebody wants to go find you on Instagram, what is your, uh, what's your Instagram handle? Uh, so my Instagram is kwmurph72, so kwmurph72. I'm also on Twitter under the same handle. Yep. Um, I just don't tweet that much. I only started Twitter for, for the show. Sure. But there's a bunch of stuff on the show about or on Twitter about the show as well. So excellent. Good. So you can find Kelly on Twitter or um, Instagram um, at kwmurf72. Um, of course, if you want to get in contact with myself, you can find me on, on LinkedIn, um, Facebook, or on Twitter and Instagram. My handle is just at Corey Bittner KC. Uh, we're continuing to record more of these shows as we approach the uh, you know the end of 2020 and beyond. Uh, so if you have if you're interested yourself or if you have a specific guest that you think would be a good guest for the show, please feel free and uh, and reach out to me directly. Uh, Murph, thanks again for your time and have a great day. You too, thank you.